Good evening, everyone. I am Press Secretary Philomena Robertson. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. For this press briefing, we have present Prime Minister Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell, Acting Commissioner of Police Edwin Martin, and COVID-19 Coordinator for Grenada, Dr. Mitchell. Gentlemen, welcome to all. We are continuing in a state of emergency here in Grenada as part of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Prime Minister Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell will present an opening statement to you before you're allowed to field questions. Dr. Mitchell? Thank you, Philo. Microphone. Thank you, Philo. And of course, good evening to all Grenadians, Caracunians, and Peter Martinicans at home and abroad. As we come to the end of this seven-day period of the state of emergency, I hereby inform our nation that a 24-hour curfew continues to be in effect. From 12 noon today, the sixth day of April, 2020, and ending at 7 a.m. on the 20th day of April, 2020. Sisters and brothers, it is not an easy decision to make, but your government is convinced that having regard to the medical experts and the reports, that the action your government is taking is in the best interest of the people of our country. We continue to see the stark images and hear the horror stories from around the world as countries grapple with the devastating effects of COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, we must continue to take actions in the best interests of public safety and the public health, and to safeguard you, the people, and citizens of this country who are our greatest assets. Government cannot do this alone, sisters and brothers. Every one of us must help. I cannot stress enough how important it is for everyone to remain confined to their place of residence during the curfew so that we can minimize the potential spread of this virus in our community throughout the length and breadth of our country. Grenada's success, friends, in this fight against this virus depends on the collective efforts of all of us. Let us continue to demonstrate that we are indeed our brother's keeper. I applaud those of you who maintain the recommended distance as you went about your shopping day to day. Although for some, the concept still seems to be a major challenge. We must continue to follow the advice of the health experts as we face this health threat. We understand your frustration, sisters and brothers, and we understand also your sacrifices, and we continue to modify our approaches as we get requests about problems with 
in our community faced by our citizens. But as you know, there is no perfect solution. We will continue to explore best practices with one goal, to keep this nation and you, the people, safe. I also wish to assure you that from the standpoint of our suppliers, our grocery store owners, and the Ministry of Agriculture, that we are not facing an imminent shortage of food. I want to repeat, we are not facing an imminent shortage of food. Because I get the impression that some of us believe this is the last day to get some items. So I really urge you not to behave as if this is the last day that food will be available. There is, from all reports, there is enough supply out there if we all are disciplined enough to get it when we need it. This unprecedented pandemic, sisters and brothers, has created challenges on many levels. And we are working to address them in a timely and comprehensive manner. I assure you that the government of Grenada, your government, is sparing no effort in addressing the economic fallout of this pandemic. The staff at the Ministry of Finance continues to work on rolling out the economic stimulus package which is designed to help to provide a buffer for businesses and workers that have been had hardest hit by this crisis. Fellow Grenadians, Caracunians, Peter Martinicans, we hear your cries. And we are working steadfastly to ease your pain. It is no comfort to me and members of your government to watch you in long lines at the supermarket. It is painful for me and for those of us in government. Government is also ensuring that vulnerable families continue to benefit from the SEED program so they can still meet, meet their basic needs. My friends, no address during this period will be complete without a sincere expression of gratitude for those at the front line of our fight against COVID-19. And therefore, on behalf of the government and people of Grenada, I thank all healthcare professionals and law enforcement officers especially for their daily sacrifices to ensure that Grenada is best positioned to weather this severe storm. I also thank all the essential workers who are powering the engine of this nation during this global pandemic. Sisters and brothers, I continue to urge compliance at all levels during this time. The state of emergency and the measures taken to protect the public health are only as effective as the compliance of all of us. On that note, I also need to make this point as a responsible citizens, citizen. And as a people who have a strong sense of community spirit, let us be better about the way we treat each other. And I'm talking about a few of us, they may not be doing so. We have received some reports 
from the families of those affected by the virus. They are de that they have been threatened and insulted in their communities. Friends, we have to keep our distance, yes. But let's, let us not go down to the road to anarchy and insensitivity. This is, this is not who we are as Grenadians, Caracunians, and Piggy Martinicans. The fight against COVID-19 is only as strong as our weakest link. In fact, always bear in mind that those of us whom you're taunting today as your neighbors for having the virus, your turn might come tomorrow. We don't know what faces any one of us. Your turn could be on now and you do not yet to know. I make a strong appeal, therefore, on behalf of all our citizens, and in particular, our affected families, to anyone engaged in such disturbing behavior, to cease and desist from such negativity. This is not who we are as a people. Finally, sisters and brothers, even in the midst of our efforts home at, here at home, let us keep in mind our fellow citizens in the diaspora who are equally and in some instances even more challenged by this pandemic. Always know that our thoughts and our prayers are with every one of you as we all face this unseen and unknown enemy. We have received reports of several of our nationals abroad who have perished in this fight. We extend, therefore, our deepest condolences to their relatives and friends. We look forward to the day when we can all gather again as a Grenadian family, and I'm quite confident that we will. Just this afternoon, we also received news that the UK Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was taken to intensive care after being stricken with a virus over the last 10 days. This is painful but significant because what it says, the virus has no respect for any person in any position, no matter what part of the world they come from. Our thoughts and prayers must be with him and are with him, his family, and all our nationals and friends in the United Kingdom at this point. We all hope for his speedy recovery and the speedy recovery of everyone, especially every Grenadian national who is affected by this virus. Friends, sisters and brothers all, let us continue to join hands, not physically, but look out for each other and take the necessary precautions to preserve our health and safety during this crisis. I'm a firm, firm believer in the almighty spirit. I believe in his, in his supreme power. And I believe that this too shall pass. I thank you and we look forward to the rest of this afternoon contact with you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and to all Grenadians and others who are tuned in via various media. The floor is now open to questions. We have several journalists who have joined us via this Zoom meeting. Are there any questions on the floor?
we have Rachel Bain with the first question. Rachel? Good afternoon, Mr. Benson. afternoon okay i have a question my question is twofold one is with regards to the the construction workers and two media workers um you spoke of your stimulus plans and stuff like that but these two um careers are not in it so what measures are in place for media workers and for construction workers <laughs> Well, we assume that the media workers will be taken care of by the respective um, institutions because it's clear that most media workers are continuing to perform their duties creditably. So I assume that is the case. The construction workers are, in fact, employed by specific companies and would have, definitely would have provisions um, for situations like what we are facing, and we expect that that would be done. But remember also, Rachel, and I understand your question, and, and you have certainly have that right to ask about your fellow media persons. But remember, the government itself is facing enormous problems at this time, that our revenue is almost less than 50% at this point in time. So the government will not be able to help every single situation. In fact, we have to limit our initiative to help to those most affected um, by this pandemic and those who we believe are more marginalized in the country. In fact, we do not expect every single hotel facility will be looking to government to pay their workers. We just will not be able to meet every single one of them. So I just wanted to make this point, but I understand what is taking place, and certainly we, we empathize with workers at all levels, and we empathize with every single business entity at this particular time. But there's just so much government can afford to do, and we do not want to, to overpromise to the point that we will disappoint almost everybody. Rachel, did you have another question, or was that it from you for now? Yes, I do. Mr. Prime Minister, what measures are in place for fishermen, those who have fishing as their only means of income? There's no other means of income. Uh, so what measures does the government have in place that would at least subsidize in some way or the other? They, they, that has come up with the, the covert secretariat who has been um, leading the whole question of implementation of the stimulus package. But as you recognize that the amount of work that had to be done in just a very short period of time to meet some sort of um, payment very soon to the, to the workforce in many areas requires enormous amount of work. The question of data. The problem you have is that many fishermen are not registered with any institution, and that's the problem we have. In many cases that we are trying to find out who we should help, people are not registered. And um, that in itself tells us a, a story that we may have to correct. Because if every fisherman and every busman or every vendor was registered with an organization and paying something to NIS to protect themselves in a latter part of their life, our job to be able to take some initiative to help them would have been much, much easier. But we don't have data. That would have to be compiled. It will take some time to do so. And therefore, it would be unlikely that we'll be able to take any initiative with fishermen, particularly this month. So work will have to start to assemble some list of persons and which category of fishermen we're talking about, which fishing vendor we're talking about. 
So we, we need to define this carefully because we do not want to make broad statement and disappoint people in the final analysis. But we understand and empathize with all the workers outside it. And the fishermen are an extremely important part of our society. And therefore, we, we need to look at this carefully, but at the same time, do it properly and not overpromise. We have the next question coming from Sherry Ann. Well, Sherry Ann, you have the floor. Thank you, and good afternoon to the panel. Um, I have a couple of questions for the Prime Minister. Um, Dr. Mitchell, you mentioned a bit about the, the whole step change. And um, during the budget, it was the Prime Minister. Um, the, Mitchell, you mentioned a bit about the, the economy is expected Sharon, please, please to turn down your audio. grow at a certain percentage um, in 2020. With what's happening now, and you having to take such drastic measures, what's the, what's the present position you would say our economy will be in in the coming months? Sherry. Sherry Ann, it was quite difficult to decipher what she was saying. Can you please turn down your audio and then you can repeat the question? Sherry, I. I think you're asking okay, um, what, what's our assessment. Okay, you want assessment. me to repeat the question? No, well, no wait, Cherry, and I think I, I may have got it, but with, with some difficulties. I, I thought I heard you ask I me. I can repeat it. No, let me say, I, I thought I heard you ask me what is our projection now, given that the budget had projected certain performance in the economy, and this whole pandemic has thrown everything upside down. Is that your question? Yes, yes. So I was right. just trying to figure out what well, position the economy stands at now. Well, <laughs> they almost have to be a magician at this time to predict <laughs> the state of play. As I indicated earlier on, our revenue uh, for the first few days of this month is minuscule. When they come now, at this point in time, customs will be showing millions of dollars. I don't think we have reached half a million dollars yet in the first few days. So if, if we project, continue to project that, uh, that pace of revenue, we'd be with some serious um, deficit coming to the rest of the year. We have not been able. There are some estimates of projection um, of economic uh, impact of the virus on, on almost every country, and in our case, Grenada. But I don't think you can say this scientifically. And I, as you know, I'm one who likes to make sure I have data to to make prediction, but you can rest assured, and I could certainly predict that we will be showing negative growth. It probably might be the first time in my entire year, life as prime minister that the country would have a, a negative growth. I, I don't see us making a positive growth. Even if this thing ends in three months as has been um, projected, I don't see it um, being, being so. And that's why I was urging Rachel a while ago when she asked the question about um, supporting. I think there is that people sometimes forget that government earns this money from activities in the country. So if government is the only reason government is able to do something right now for some part of the workforce, it's because of how we manage the economy and fiscally manage the government um, over the last several years. That's the only reason we have some room space. But that space is going to be reduced considerably in, in, in a not too distant future. So, so one has to be careful. So I can't, some predict maybe about 10% drop in, in growth. Remember, St. George's University we represent almost a quarter of the GDP of the country. There, there would be some serious drop there because a lot of the students have, have left. There would be not left much economic activity there at this time. So. That by itself will tell you that there, there will be some serious drop, even if they return in three, three months' time. OK, and part two to my question is, and I know I've, I've been following, and you said maybe within, maybe some people are saying within a three months window, um, things tend to simmer down. But um, do you have a time when you're thinking that our ports and so may be able to open up? Well, I think I think we have to. I think you're looking at the, the airport and, and places like and, and of yeah. course um, the the marinas and places like this. 
I think it be difficult to judge, but if you're going to look at what is taking place internationally, um, I think you, you one would say it will take some time because you still see New York under a lot of pressure. You see even the Prime Minister of Britain is going down, this has problems with the virus, is in hospital. And therefore, there's a lot of infection in those countries and in Europe all around the place. So unless we see a, a serious reduction, almost a, a, a stoppage of this infection in our traditional markets where tourists come, it's going to be difficult to open the border because we may be opening to our own demise. So it's, it's sort of difficult to predict. Hopefully, if things get in control within two months and then another month to make sure that it, it goes down to almost zero, then we can look at some, some um, methodology of, of opening our ports. But I can't predict that. It's very difficult to predict right now. Okay, so can I just put in a, a, a final question? Um, in terms, you, you mentioned a bit about the, the facilities. Um, um, is there, from the medical standpoint, are they constantly um, trying to reach out to them, those who are being, for want of a better word, heckled because they have come down with the virus? I didn't get that. I didn't get that. I didn't get that question. Okay. I, I was lot, asking, you mentioned um, for mm. people to refer from saying things to the, the families yes. who have contracted the virus. I'm asking if counseling is already available to them to help them cope through. Yeah. I'll, ask, I'll ask um, Dr. George Mitchell, or COVID or coordinator, to, to attempt to answer this. Thank you. Uh, what's her name? Sherry Ann for this question and good afternoon to, to everyone. The answer to your question is we have reached out uh, to the families and I can give you uh, certainty in, about that because I personally reached out uh, yesterday and this morning to the family uh, ensuring that they are okay in the sense and that they know that they have our support. They have requested that um, we make statements and as the Prime Minister did, and I was very happy that the Prime Minister made this call to ensure that persons don't continue to uh, do this distasteful uh, things that they are doing out there. Um, so yes, we have, and the counseling, yes, is on its way. Um, we have a team that is uh, already assembling, and they will be contacting those persons. But to answer your question, yes, we have not left any stone unturned to ensure that these families feel safe. And, and let me even just add, uh, add um, the family of of, of one of those families reached out to me from the UK, and I have been in touch with him, um, giving him our solidarity and letting him know that yes, we are um, going to be there for them and taking care of them. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell. Sherry, do you have another question? I will come back after the others have gotten an opportunity. All right. Good evening, everybody. Dr. Mitchell, can you tell us when grocery stores or gas stations will be opened again? Uh, thank you very much um, for the question, and good evening, one and all. Um, as it relates to that question, the next time, uh, the next shopping day, I should indicate, will be uh, Saturday, um, but certainly you will have significant changes to that. My observation for what transpired today, certainly we cannot continue with that formula. So we will be revisiting how we allow this, whether you're going to have shopping and fueling taking place at the same day, and whether we have all the sectors receiving fuel, etc., on the same day as well. So tentatively, the next shopping day, not tentatively, the next shopping day will be Saturday, but we're likely to have some movement between now and then 
in order to mitigate the impact and minimize the inconveniences and challenges that we face today. I think it's important to just um, add something to what the commissioner pointed out. I think we all have to come to terms, um, brothers and sisters, that we are really in uncharted territory. There are people working night and day attempting to put systems in place to do one thing, to protect life. Because no matter what else we try to do, material thing is unimportant if you have no, if you are not healthy. So in putting systems in place, there are holes and weaknesses, and, and we are seeing them. We want people to know. It, it, don't sit back and just criticize. If you have a good idea, I have received ideas from a lot of people, even Grenadians abroad. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? These are men and women, uh, 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 a human in their own way. And, um, and so whenever things are done with the best of intention, then we see some of the problems em emanating from it. And, and the commission is absolutely right. What they saw today would inform uh, some modification of how we operate tomorrow. So, um, and another day, sorry. So I think, I think it's, remember, we are open. Our job is to protect life, but at the same time, to do it in, with the minimal and inconveniences as possible. I have a question here from Linda Straker. Why is the shutdown longer than before, and what are the specific objectives of this period? You want to repeat a question for me? Why is this shutdown longer than before, and what are the specific objectives of this period? <laughs> the objective, as the Prime Minister said, is to ensure that we do all that we can to save life. And we have entered a, a crucial phase in terms of the spread of COVID in our country. We know that, and we have reported that we have had 12 cases to date, and we have not had more. So if that question is due to come, I want to answer it up front. And we believe that if we take this measure that we are about to take, or that we are taking, it gives us a really, really, really good opportunity to see where we are in terms of ensuring and minimizing and containing the spread. As you know, COVID-19 is spread by people coming into contact with one another. So that is the limitation. That is the measure that we are taking to try and ensure that we get this done. Now, how do we do that? Of course, we are asking persons to stay at home, to minimize contact. And we are going to also use the opportunity to do some testing. And I know that question is going to come up as well about our ability to test. So I'm going to endeavor to answer it as I speak, as I have the floor. Yes, uh, apart from today, we are in a position to do testing in Grenada. And I want to repeat, we are in a position to do testing in Grenada. All of the preliminary work and the preliminary logistics have been put in place. I have been in contact with uh, the folks at SGU who, in collaboration with our lab techs at the hospital, have done the run or the reruns of those uh, machines that are testing. All the controls have been done, and so to speak, we are ready to go. A um, few minutes ago, virtually, I was in touch and was at the lab in SGU um, to ensure and to validate that that process is ready. What else can I say? Um, this is good news um, for us. Um, we will have the ability, once samples are, 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 are collected, that we can run them and have the results in the same day. So I wanted to let the nation know that. And uh, suffice to say that we have to say uh, a really, really big thank you to the Pan American Health Organization, to CAFA, to St. George's University, and to Windruff for this collaboration with the government and people of Grenada. Linda, just to, just to add, I have a distinct feeling that 
your question is leading to the concern whether in fact we have any evidence of any mass infection that is causing. Uh, I want to go straight to where you are. And uh, no, no, there isn't. In fact, in fact, the additional measures being taken is because we see evidence that we might be going through getting past the critical period. So we want to ensure that we do not, we do not go backwards, but we're going from here forward. So to do that is to, 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 to lock down things as much as, much as possible so that we do not have a, a problem later. So it's a protective measure, if anything else. It's a good sign. I'm telling you this. It is a good sign. And as Dr. George Mitchell said, um, the hope is that we won't see more of this and that we can well, maybe in two weeks' time, another week time, we, we might be see a, 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 a lessening of the tightening of the lockdown procedure that we are implementing. So I think we should feel relatively happier that we are locking down things so that that period where people are get, were able to get infected, they will no longer be there. And that because the borders are closed from outside, then, then the chances of further infection um, will, not, will not be real. So I think that, that's easy. So I, I hope I, I got to the point you're trying to get to, Linda. Linda has a second, a second question here. While she can understand the rationale behind no consumption of alcohol in public, can we explain the rationale for not selling alcohol for private consumption? The sale of alcohol in a general context is one that tends to, based on our own culture, that tends to pull people to gravitate together. And whether or not that be in a private or public space. And the intention here is to limit the tendency or inclination for persons who want to pool together, whether in private or public space, for the purpose of having a drink, cognizant of what our culture is. And again, it is another effort to try to attempt to make sure that we minimize the probability of persons getting together and mini minimizing the potential for any possible transmission that may exist. That's as long and short of it. Thank you. One other question here. There are companies who need to deposit checks to pay staff. When will there be banking? When will there be a banking day for such purposes? I, I will address this, address this as well. Um, we need to understand in this context, and not that we need to understand, but I'll just state what the state of affairs is. At, at, at this present time, what we are trying to achieve is to reduce the potential of the growth and expansion of infection in Grenada. And what we are trying to do in the shortest possible, possible time to make sure that we stem further infections and start to reverse the trend. And yes, banks is a place where this actually happens, where not where transmission takes place, but that people gather. And as such, we want to minimize as much as possible the areas where persons do not have to necessarily gather. And if we can do that successively for short periods of time and we see evidence of a reversal, I am confident that we will see those facilities opening. Um, discussions from the meetings I have attended are already in train of the possibility of this happening in short order. So to make it a reality, what we are appealing to for persons is to continue to cooperate and support the initiatives that are in place so that we will be in a good place sooner rather than later that not only banks but many other institutions, businesses and that are affected will be opened up and we can actually come back to some state of normalcy. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the bankers themselves and employers are concerned yes, yes. about their own health. Huh? Yes. Um, the, it is recognized the people that came in and have been tested positive they all went to banks, and that has scared the employees. Um, and you know, money is one of the source of, 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 of carrying um, possible um, virus. 
So one has to realize the workers in the bank also themselves are, are thinking about their own lives. And the managers and owners of the banks also are, are concerned about the welfare of their staff. So it's not just about what government would like to see and what the regulations we would like to, Im to implement, but also what the bankers themselves. So that discussions are being held with the commissioner and, and other members of the COVID-19 cabinet um, appointed team to look at ways of easing up the pain. We recognize, as I pointed out earlier on, we are on uncharted territories. And as things come up and we have find out about the problems being created, we could adjust accordingly, but we need the cooperation of all concerned. And therefore, that, that, that's a, a, a work in progress. And, and certainly, you would hear about any modification of what we are doing at this time. We also heard about the problems with the lack of ATM banking by certain institutions. And for example, a credit union and some of the poor people are the ones um, most affected by, by, this, by this problem. So this is another area we're looking at and working with the credit union and the bankers and the COVID-19 team, we will see what else we can do. But as I said, friends, brothers and sisters all, you have ideas, don't be afraid to call in and offer constructive ideas. Just sitting back at home and be sitting back on and, and just criticizing won't solve the problem. Bring your ideas forward, we are very open to any serious idea to modify some of the problems that people are facing out there. Johnson Richardson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to you and your, and your panelists. Uh, my question really is, uh, I've traveled, I want to commend the police officers for an excellent job thus far in the various checkpoints and so on around the country. But I've been living in St. Mark. Um, I've been traveling to and for through the various parts of the island. And uh, while St. Mark is the, the smallest parish in, in Grenada, I realize, unlike the other parishes, we have two checkpoints, uh, in fact, three checkpoints. One at, at Samaritan Presbyterian. Uh, we have one at um, down at St. John's, St. Max, St. John's, St. George's, uh, exiting St. John's. Um, and of course, we have one at Waltham in St. Mark. Um, I, want to, I want to find out for whatever reason, what is the purpose for the one in, in, in Waltham? Um, is it St. Mark is an area of concern as uh, relates to COVID-19, the amount of cases on the island? What exactly and what's the reason for the, 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 the checkpoint at Walter Minson now? And that's my only my first question. I have a second question I'd like to follow up on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, certainly the, the establishment of the of the checkpoints primarily, primarily is to control the movement in and out of parishes. So obviously you would have, you would have definitely at least have one on either end. Um, if, however, if, however, there are a number of reasons that there can be additional checkpoints. For example, I don't know if you traveled through St. George's um, on any of the particular days of full curfew, but we have a multiplicity of checkpoints all over St. George's because you also want to mitigate and to reduce the, 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 the traveling that takes place within the parish as well, because some persons, you actually, the intention is for you to stay at home and quarantine yourself for the period of time that is intended. And we need to minimize as much as possible people taking the liberties to actually go out and do different things. And the visibility and presence of the police at critical junctures is important for us to be able to achieve that. Um, I cannot speak with authority to the geographic and road network of the Waltham, but I want to believe that that might be one of the reasons why that checkpoint was established. But you've charged me with a, a responsibility here, and I will look at St. Mark's in particular after this press conference. Thank you for the question. Johnson, you had a second question? I will look at St. Mark's in particular. Yes. After this yes. I. 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 Um. My. My. And I just a follow up on the first question. Really. Um. Yes. Yes. Um. Philo. Um. I said there is only one. There are only one or two Johnson, supermarkets. Johnson, please, please supermarkets. turn down your audio. Please turn down your audio. 
Yeah, yeah there are only two supermarkets in St. Mark, and they're both located at um, Victoria. So people coming out from the northern part of St. Mark would not be able to access those those supermarkets. And if you have if you have uh, the, the 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 boundaries at, at the, par the parish boundaries, then it's basically uh, um, impossible to access those those those, um, those supermarkets for the people at northern St. Mark. You know, and that's a problem. But that's a, my that's a, my 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 second question though is um, is restocking the the supermarkets in the in the respective parishes. And one of the concerns I, I I spoke to one of the one of the owners of a supermarket this afternoon, and his concern was was that while there are while there are the restrictions for for movements. Um, the, the service trucks and that, that, that enter St. Mark's, enter the area, are basically empty when they get to, 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 to St. Mark. All right? Um, um, so they are requesting permission to, to, to travel out of the area and knowing that there are restrictions in place. Um, if provisions can be made to have them, um, while the service truck cannot reach them, that they go and get the, so get the, the supplies so at least the people of the area can, 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 be, can be taken care of. Uh, thank you very much for the question again. Um, actually, that is uh, a measure that we have taken. Um, however, St. Mark did not come to my attention. One of the issues that one of the things we try to do is to give the best possibility that every parish can have all the supplies that we require in, to serve the communities. And so we have made the decision, and I know there have been, um, from St. Patrick in particular, some of the suppliers there, we allow them to travel to St. George's to collect supplies in addition to having the supply trucks from St. George's come out to do exactly what you are asking. We will look at the St. Mark situation, and if there are suppliers that can do that on the days that we are doing it, we will adjust it. We have also realized that doing the, the restocking on the days that are shopping may not be the best option. We need to make sure that the shops are well stocked before shopping days. So going forward, we will revisit that as well. Because you actually, the shop is empty and the trucks are now leaving St. George's to bring up supplies. It makes no sense. So we definitely will look at revisiting how we do the time for the supplies to come out that when we do shopping days, the, all the shops and supermarkets, mini marts, et cetera, should be properly stocked. And the crisis of waiting for stuff to come up should not should be a thing of the past and should not happen again. So thanks for the question and the ability to bring out that that bit of information. Commissioner, you, while, while you're on the subject of restocking, we have a question from Carrie Koo in terms of uh, allowing cargo boats to come up to restock the supermarkets and the shops up there. Okay, thank you very much for Carrie Koo. Um, if my memory serves me right, I think Amelia. Uh, the boat Amelia would have left today um, with supplies for Kariku. Uh, we continue to collaborate with Kariku to the Minister and the Ministry of Kariku to meet the needs peculiar to Kariku needs. Um, and today, certainly, I know I had to give passes to a number of farmers to get to bring produce onto the boat in order that Kariku can have adequate supply. So I, I believe that the Amelia should be carrying up um, supplies for Kariku today and probably in Kariku already as we speak, maybe, depending on the time of departure. Thank you. I just want to make a point, maybe slightly controversial, but I think it's important in, in the context of the public health. I have a concern at Kariku and Peter Martinique in the context of what is taking place in the Grenadines. St. Vincent has not locked down their borders. And I mean, I have to speak to that because I have to be concerned about life. I cannot tell the leadership of St. Vincent what to do, but if their decision affects the life of the people of Karakwam Pidi I have to be concerned. A lot of people get food stuff from, from St. Vincent, and therefore one has to be careful. The borders between St. Vincent, the Grenadines, and Pidi Martinique is almost open. I, the commissioner and his people would have to be doing a lot more work. The fact is, if we close our borders because of the possibility of infection, whether it's from a Caribbean country or whether it's from the United States or China or Russia, 
or wherever the country comes from, we have to protect our people. I remember when this all started, there was all this concern about Chinese, 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 Chinese coming here. The infection we've had so far have not been any Chinese coming in here with anyone here, right? I want us to be concerned. As I said, I am speaking. I know it's controversial, but I am not the type who like to hold my mouth when I see something it's absolutely necessary to speak about. So we have to protect our brothers and sisters in Karakou and Pili Martinique from what is taking place in the Grenadines at this particular time. Junior George, you have the floor. Hey, thank you, Philomena, and thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, oh, also, thanks for recognizing the folks here in the diaspora. Um, right now in New York, I'm in Queen, one of the hardest hit areas here in the United States, um, where it's, it's a difficult situation. Just It's emotional, it's emotionally trying on all of us, it's depressing. Uh, we, every day, every minute of the day is sirens and death. Is, that's what we see in here. So I, I appreciate the fact that you recognize the folks in the diaspora. We really are going through a lot at this point in time. Uh, but my question is, after looking at a, a news article that came out from, uh, from Barbados, where the Barbados authorities are saying that certain equipment was held back from entering Barbados after it was ordered. Uh, my question is, does Grenada have any problem getting equipment as far as, far as ventilators and other uh, personal protective devices that are not meeting our shows because of uh, it's been withheld or holed up by any other authority outside of Grenada? Junior, first of all, let me um, empathize with you, with uh, the diaspora community yourself and all of those who we are watching the reports of what is taking place in Queens and Brooklyn. Um, these are places where there's a high concentration of Caribbean people and Grenadian people. So I, I, I could understand how you feel and um, all of us feel at this particular time. So, so I, uh, I think I just want everyone to understand that our prayers are with them at this particular time. I, in fact, uh, lost to one of my former cricketing brothers, Kingston Murray, um, who passed away. He was one of Grenada's fearsome fast bowler in the 70s um, who, who played with me. So this is taking a lot of toll on a lot of families throughout the length and breadth of this country and those of our friends and brothers and sisters abroad. Now, to answer specifically, we. We, uh, we did get the information about what took place with the Barbados situation. What is happening, even in America, you notice there is this competition between states. In other words, people are just fighting for their own communities. What is happening, America now has a problem with ventilators, and it's insisting that, that all ventilators must be, take, must be kept in America. So any 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 list of vent ventilators that come to America but might pose some problem. It is not fair, but you know, this is the nature of the world that we're living in. People look for themselves first and others have to fend for themselves. So we have not had it directly because we have learned from that lesson and we're using other, other um, alternative. We are not going to allow our ventilators or any possible support system to come through America because we realize it might, in fact, be be be, be left there. So, so Junior, we we are take we have taken steps. In fact, I think we have we have received some some um, support um, equipment today. I believe landed today, but it didn't go through America. <laughs> okay, my next my next quick question is, as it relates to the drug, high, I think it's hydrochloroquine that a drug that has been recommended by the president that is said to be a very effective drug in treating uh, the coronavirus. I know a lot of different um, hospitals in the U.S. Is, are using it um, with some level of success. Um, and also there is a drug um, from, from Cuba, which also is said to boost the immune system. I'm I'm curious to, to, to know that what's Grenada's position on any one of those drugs. If any one of those drugs are are are, are thinking of, are are in 
uh, being prescribed by doctors or does Grenada have any availability to those drugs on the island at the moment? I, 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 let, I let Dr. Mitchell to address the, the health issue involved. And I, I want to address the political aspect of this. I, I, I'm a politician, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a health expert. And any politician who wants to play doctor, I leave it up to them to do so. I will not be one recommending any drug until the, the doctors and the scientists indicate that enough tests have been done to justify it. I've, I've been reading and listening all aspects of drugs. In fact, one major scientist who are involved in research at all levels um, and, and it's supported by many of the scientists in the United States, said this, this, this um, whole COVID-19 might be uh, solved by not just one drug like HIV. It might be a combination of, of, of drugs to deal with it. So I don't think we have enough information and the side effects of one drug could be a major problem for an individual. So what might be successful in one patient may not necessarily be successful in another person. So one has to be careful. So I would certainly not want to recommend as a politician. So I, that's why I said let Dr. George Mitchell, who the COVID expert and is a medical doctor, um, ad address the, the medical aspect of this. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. And Junior George, thank you for your question. Uh, the answer to your question is that yes, our protocol or management protocol that uh, has been developed by our medical team does involve the use of hydro hydroxychloroquine. Um, it is not the only drug that is being used, but it forms part of uh, the regimen and the protocol that uh, we use here in Grenada. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, next up, we have Sherry Ann Blackman of GBN. Pleasant good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, the first question I want to ask is to you. Um, have there been any figures given in regard to Grenadians who have been residing in the U.S. and the U.K. that have died as a result of COVID? Any figures from the diaspora? Not, not yet, but we are now, uh, we are now attempting to do that statistics. We, we have see, asked our embassies abroad to to uh, attempt to give us a listing. In fact, we thought it was necessary from many standpoints, but also to ensure that we can make contact with the families and offer our condolences and in this very touching time for, for, for all of them. So that is something in, 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 in the works, um, Sherry Ann. Secondly, for me, there are 52 Grenadians on board, two cruise ships in Florida and they have been begging to come home. Have there been any discussions and decisions on that particular issue? Yes, there have been discussions. The Minister of Tourism has have certainly raised it, but it's a very difficult issue. It's not something we can say just, just bring them home because clearly they're coming from infected areas and um, therefore to, to bring all of them in one time uh, um, um, we, that means we'll have to have the facilities to quarantine all of them. And I'm afraid at this point in time, we do not necessarily, but there are preparation being done. They have a right to come home, and they have a right to receive the support from us. But at the same time, there is a right also to protect all the citizens of this country from infection. So we have to balance the, the, this issue in a very serious way. But thanks for the question. I have another um what are the preliminary unemployment figures that you have been receiving thus far as it relates directly to COVID-19? We haven't had the statistics yet, Charion. Um, we haven't had that yet, um, but we certainly will be, will be looking specifically at, at those numbers because we, we, are, we are dreading that, that number at this particular time. And finally for me, um, the world bank would have given um 160 billion dollars over the next 15 months to support covid 19 measures what is the share of that quantity that Grenada is going to be getting and what is that money going to be used for well many of the financial institutions regionally and internationally have certainly um been in discussion with 
governments throughout the region to 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 for the facilities that they have made available. But each of them have conditions, and of course, proposal had to be written. So we are actively pursuing every single one of them as chairman of the Monetary Council of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. And we've just, of course, met. And um, there are serious resources that will be made available to Grenada, um, over $62 million for both private and, and public sector at 2% interest. And of course, the Caribbean Development Bank is also making, in fact, only this afternoon, I had um, discussion with one leading economist of the Caribbean Development Bank for specific support. The World Bank has been in two, two, in two meetings with the regional leaders um, about specific help. The IMF also. So we are touching all bases. UNDP has also provided some specific support, the European Union. We are touching base, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance and other agencies, they are working. Our ambassadors abroad also in Brussels and other places are working. One thing I can tell you, is because Grenada has managed itself very well in the last six, seven years, we are at the top of the, of the list of any specific help to be given to the region. We would be one of the first persons that would qualify because of the way of managed our economy. So the, the, the opportunity for support looks very good, but we won't count the chicken before it's hatched. Thank you very much, uh, Sherry and Rena. I know you're waiting, but because you're also represent the GBN, I'll just allow another media house to go before you. Mikey, you're on. Okay, I would like to say hello and thank you to um, the panel for giving me the opportunity to ask my questions. I have two questions here to ask. My first question is, what is the rationale for Saturday being designated as the next shopping day? Mikey, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Um, I thought this question was addressed earlier on when I answered to the fact that uh, we are at a critical moment uh, in the fight against COVID-19. Um, we want to ensure that there is no spread, no more spread, that we minimize spread as much as possible while we uh, get or have the ability to test and to ensure that we have a fair amount of control over the situation. And um, just to sort of piggyback on what the Prime Minister said, it is not an issue that we, we have a bad situation that we need to control. It is not that at all, but we think that we are at a critical point that most of the persons who have uh, tested positively and their contacts have already uh, elapsed, their contacts have already elapsed the 14 day period. It, that is important for us. And the few persons who have been in contact with uh, positive cases are closing down on their 14 day. So it is a critical period for us. And so at any point, we think that during the next few days, once we are able to test those contacts who are left, who have not, whose periods of time have not elapsed, the 14 days, if we can test them, we can get a very good appreciation of where we are. And so, it, it, you know, my, my, my fellow um, scientists, as Peter David would call them, Minister Peter David would call them, have sort of like modeled that if we can assure that this period that we control and we test in this period, we will be very, 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 uh, we'll be set in a very, very good way or put ourselves in a good place to be able to open up gradually as we go forward. Dr. Mitchell, okay, I understand um, Dr. the Mitchell, medical... Um, um, maybe, sorry, I, maybe I will be a little more specific. Um, I appreciate that explanation. But with regards to Saturday um, being a possible challenge for some persons of the religious community, I was trying to understand what's the difference between the Saturday or, and a Sunday or on a Friday. Okay, Mikey, um, with all due respects to um, our um, folks in the who are Seventh-day Adventists, and just, let, uh, just so that you know, um, that is a religion that I have a lot of respect for. As a matter of fact, I, I grew up in that, in that faith, and um, no, 
the serious consideration was not given to open on a Saturday to disrespect any religion per se, um, but we just thought that it was the period that we needed to ensure that things that we had a hold on uh, so that we could have opened up. But um, I think that was the decision. Um, COP? I agree. OK. Mikey, I just have one Mikey, more Mikey, question. Mikey, 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 just Dr. One, Mitchell. Yeah, just one point. I, I believe um, the committee, when there were discussions today. I was not part of the committee discussion, so I assume I'll get some report on this later. But I think that point is understood. And um, we, we will certainly be looking at ways in which we can, we can deal with this. Because it, it is a concern, and we don't want any religious community to feel um, um, marginalized or dealt on an even hand by any decision that we take. Because we value the, the religious community and the role they're playing in, in helping us in this very crucial period that we face in this country. Okay, uh, thanks for that explanation. And my final question is, there's a lot of concern regarding um, community spread. How do you determine who gets tested for COVID? Is it purely based on symptoms or is it based on likelihood of contact with an infected person? And I'm asking that question so that we can get a better appreciation for the mechanism that has been used um, to detect community spread. Uh, very smart question, Mikey. Yes, uh, our epidemiologists and all the modelings that we we have uh, formulated um, gives us the op gives us the opportunity to test who we think are most likely to have contracted the disease. So we go on a model of uh, exposure. So, for example, in terms of priorities. At the moment, our number one priority is to test persons who have been uh, exposed or in contact with persons who have been positive. So that's our first and immediate and our greatest priority at this time. Um, the second priority uh, for us in terms of testing are going to be persons who have, who healthcare workers, for example, who have been on the front line. And not only healthcare workers, uh, COP, but police officers um, who have been on the front line and anybody who have responded in some way to a COVID-19 case. And um, our third priority is going to be anybody at this time who comes down with some form of viral illness so that we are not just narrowing ourselves to persons who have potential exposure, but just in case we have anybody out there, we are also going to be looking to test them. So we have modeled so that we try and minimize us losing or anybody escaping that net that we have created. If, if I may just extend a bit on this question. Um, what Dr. Mitchell has explained is also captured within uh, the new drafted regulations for this period, um, where the strategy is to be able to capture everyone who has been in contact with anyone of suspicion or anyone that is flu-like, having any flu-like symptoms. And the new regulation now is actually indicating that anyone who traveled to Grenada as of night, ma March 9th and after ought to self-quarantine and self-isolate. And that if you know anyone and you have interacted with anyone who have traveled to Grenada March 9th forward, um, on to this time, you should report that. And beyond that, that if you also notice anyone with flu-like symptoms, you should report that to the nearest police station. And that if you yourself are experiencing flu-like symptoms, you should also report that to the nearest police station, who of course will pass the report on to the medical unit. And the, the, the reason for that, as Dr. Mitchell explained, is to broaden now that we have the capacity for testing, is to identify the potential of persons or the number of persons having symptoms and our ability to have early interventions, possibly testing. So we, at the end of this period, we really should be in a good place. I just thought I make the point to tie that intention explained by Dr. Mitchell with how we are also capturing it with regulation. Rena Pear, you now have the floor. 
Okay, good night to everybody. I have a couple questions I hope that I get to ask all of them. Um, Dr. Martin, could you please give me an update as it relates to the amount of tests that we've done so far and if we have any pending. Also, could you give me an update as it relates to the elderly? What has been done for them? Uh, it's been a while I've heard anything. Um, so could you give me an update as it relates to that? My other question is directed to Prime Minister and you, Mr. Um, Commissioner Martin, but just waiting for doctor to answer my questions. Uh, thank you for your question, Rena. Uh, to date, we have uh, sent down 45 tests uh, to CAFR. Uh, we have had uh, results for all of them, uh, so we have none pending at this moment. Um, the elderly, what is happening as it relates <laughs> sorry, to the sorry. elderly? Uh, well, during our plan, um, you would uh, remember that uh, point four on our strategic plan was to specifically attend or to, to mitigate our elderly folks um, becoming ill. We thought that it was an important area for us. We have heard all and seen all that has happened in the diaspora where uh, facilities, uh, elderly homes, etc., had um, a lot of casualties and we, we, we really wanted to make sure that we protect our, our elderly folks. So that um, particular point in our response, our strategic intervention is being led by the Ministry of Social Development who have um, had um, training for the staff who have um, ensured that persons there get face masks and all the necessary precautionary measures that we could bring to bear on that particular group to ensure that uh, infections are not passed on to them um, is ongoing and uh, will be uh, made more and more as, as we go on so that um, so that, that group um, is protected as much as we can. All right, understanding that um, understanding that persons cannot access the bank and maybe they are not able to access the salaries because some of them would have been home for a couple of days without receiving the salary due to the, let's say the fortnight not ending at that time. A lot of people are not relying on their family members overseas, including the elderly who mm -hmm. I know, I know of a lot of people mm -hmm. complaining that they would have spend the money that they would have received the last Thursday of last month already and not able to shop. Is there any consideration um, MoneyGram and Western Union being open anytime? Also, as it relates to um, suppliers, would there be days, would the suppliers be able to get gas for their vehicles as well? That is also an issue that has been, um, that they have been having. Uh, Rina, the issue of financial institutions opening has been a uh, 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 lively discussion point um, during our meeting. We do understand that there are so many varied um, issues relating to that. And yes, um, this one came up pretty late um, in terms of uh, the need to have these institutions opened. So yes, um, that would be taken on board to better um, serve that percentage of the population who rely on that. But um, that would be a decision that would be um, contemplated on as we go forward. On the issue of gas for, on the issue of gas for suppliers, if I can answer that for you, um, we have identified very clearly that this is two days now that suppliers have been going around the country supplying. So of course I don't think they can do a third day without gas. So the strategy will be, and this is not just for suppliers, but we also have a number of workers who are working the supply chain as well that need to provide with fuel, salesmen, staff who are stuck in the vans, et cetera, that needs to go out. Um, so together with my preliminary remarks or my initial remarks, as it relates to a new strategy in ensuring that our shops are stocked before shopping day and not suppliers coming with supplies when the shops are open but empty, will, that strategy will also take on board, making sure that the workers as well as the supply trucks 
have fuel up and be able to operate seamlessly. So that will be considered. Thank you. Okay. My final question is to you, Prime Minister Mitchell. Um, are you aware of any flight from the U.S. coming in on Thursday with Canadians? No, I'm not aware. No, I, I would be shocked because the airport is supposed to be closed. So I'm, I'm not aware of this at all. Uh, that, would, that would be a shocking piece of news. Um, so, no, Rena, I'm sorry. I have not heard that, and I don't expect it. One, one thing I want, to urge, I want to urge all persons, it's unfortunate, but they have all sorts of rumors. Uh, I saw something this afternoon. I couldn't believe it. it. was purporting to come from a health expert in Grenada. They closed down everything, get ready, because things are in bad shape. You know, and, and, and I think what was being sad about this is was being sent forwarded to a lot of other people who got scared. And if it reached me, it tells you how scared people were. And, and I think people just have to be discerning at this time, listen to official statements from the government. We have no reason to lie to you. To lie to you is to lie to ourselves and, and of course, to be found guilty later and pay a heavy penalty. We have the independent persons involved in providing information. Dr. George Mitchell has been a, your CMO for years as a public servant. He has no reason to come here and lie for anybody. Our commissioner of police has a fundamental responsibility for security. He can't afford to be telling lies. And, and I just want us to all to just be more discerning and stop forwarding messages that frightens other people because some of us might have weak heart and you never know you might send us to, to the great beyond so be very careful okay i have a final question i know that i said it's the last one just another question um it's regarding the concerns of persons who run on the farm program the apple picking program in canada and other places um is there any discussions with the farm owners as it relates to the persons who are not able to go over to canada as it relates to, you know, maybe next year or later on in months, persons are concerned about their job as it relates to that. No, we have had, I have had no information on that, and, and therefore we'll deal with it when, when that comes up. The Minister of Labor, who's also Foreign Minister, has not informed us about any problems in that area. So when it comes up, we'll deal with it, Raina. Uh Odette Campbell, you're next. We don't seem to be hearing from Odette there, so I'll just go to uh, questions. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Go ahead, Odette. What is the timeline for payments to persons identified as beneficiaries of the stimulus package who have already submitted information requested? As question one, timeline for payments to beneficiaries who have already submitted their information. Question two. Would Nawasa be offering concessions on rates since people are required to sympathize more of them? Well, I think, I think the, or that the issue of the um, information, I think the workers and businesses can submit the information as, as early as possible. And um, I, while there are deadlines, I don't know that we receive information slightly late that we would we would not want to um, proceed with with um, dealing with it so I, I think we we can certainly want to ensure that we can do so but the, the thing about payment as you are aware the problem and challenges we have is that everybody's on lockdown and the public service is also on lockdown and it requires a lot of paperwork a lot of information so that's why I want to compliment. There are a lot of excellent public servants. We have those who have not stepped up to the plate, but there are others who have provided human service night and day, attempting to, to, to contact all hoteliers, all businesses, to, to look at the workforce and going through the list and deciding how much we can be able to pay people in a given time. But we hope we can do so by the 20th of April. But don't, don't stick me to that too completely because I know I'm not the one 
doing the hard work of going through the data and doing the things. So, so while uh, that's our intention, because we want to do it before we look at government payroll, which we also, the staff has to also do. So th there are a lot of challenges there or that at this particular time. Uh, I can't remember the, the other point you raised. What was the other point? What? The second question, Mr. Prime Minister, would the WASA be offering concessions on rates since people are required to sanitize? Poor, poor WASA. <laughs> WASA already don't get enough money to meet the fundamental bills. We, 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 we are looking at the, the more lucrative companies, uh, Grand Lake and, and the telephone companies. They, they, they are in a better position to provide concessions, and, and therefore we are asking them to do so, and we we certainly behind them um, in, in that respect. But I, I don't expect Nawasa. Nawasa was not in a position. If anybody has to do anything with water rates, it would have to be government again coming forward and providing the resources, not Nawasa directly, because they are, they are very challenged, challenged at this particular time. Thank you very much, Odette. Uh, Prime Minister, I have a question that came in here via message. What support is there for um, persons with uh, agricultural produce that is um, spoiling? We have, in fact, um, been looking at this. Uh, the marketing board has been looking with the Ministry of Agriculture, attempting to work with the farmers. You know, we are looking at some, some sort of help for the market vendors, even if it's just a one-off um, that we are looking at. So they are, they, but that's the problem with this whole, whole, some of the things that we want to do. The question of collection of data, who to pay, who to provide support to. So you could have the best of intention, but we can't throw government money away. And at the same time, we can't leave out those who are badly needed of the support. So there, it's a very complicated situation. I assume after we've done the first set of payments, we expect to see some people coming forward and say, well, I was left out. And would you consider me? So that, that, that's an area we, we, it's a work in progress. Thank you, Prime Minister. I just want you to wear your um, chairman of the Monetary Council hat for a moment here. Um, what is the preliminary economic impact facing the sub-region? I know the council met, met recently. What, what was discussed along those lines? Well, they are expecting a bit tremendous drop in economic activity for the entire sub-region. The estimates are run to sometimes um, ranges from 10 to 30, 40% drop in, in economic activity over the sub-region. So it's going to be high, but as I said before, there's no data right now that we can use to, to, to make a, a scientific and correct estimate. But we expect within another month or two, there should be enough information that gives us an opportunity for good pro projection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister. Lesian, I think you have two questions for the other two panelists. Yes. First of all, Mr. Commissioner, how are we going to address the congestion in subsequent days for shopping and if there's a prolonged period of shutdown? And then for Dr. George Mitchell, from the Ministry of Health standpoint, how encouraged are you with Grenada's efforts in the fight against COVID-19? Thank you very much for the question. Um, there are a number of factors, first of all, that contributed, that we believe contributed to the congestion we witnessed today. We experimented for the first time, allowing um, persons from the parish of St. David to come into St. George. Um, and that was a conscious decision, bearing in mind that there are no large supermarkets, mini marts in St. David, to provide adequate support to the needs of the people there. Um, so the first day, which had some challenges, they are, the measures we put in place for the first day was inadequate to handle the volume of that increase. So certainly we have recognized with the increase in vehicles, with passes for caregivers and farmers and suppliers have to come on board and workers, police officers, notice all of the essential services. One of the things that is a significant con factor contributing to congestion is having all of the activities on the same day. We need to break that up. Um, refueling and supplying on different days and shopping days independent. So we're going to look at that and see how best we can redistribute the activities across the period of time that will allow us not to compromise the overarching intention of mitigating transmission, 
but at the same time be able to manage the situation. If we do not do this, I think we will actually be self-defeating ourselves by going with a system that just brings people too long. People today, I admire, in the initial stages were maintaining distances for very long lines, up to two miles, people maintaining distances. But as the day prolong, as the hours go long, people start to get weighing down and started to, to look for cool spots to stand and so forth. So we have to address that. And I assure you, we will put mechanisms in place. This planning committee is very aggressive in addressing all of the challenges and we will have mechanisms and the public will learn of that certainly before the next shopping period. Uh, let me answer this question by saying that um, or actually taking my hands off to the men and women that represent the Ministry of Health at all levels in Grenada. The hospital staff has been tremendous. The Ministry of Health staff has been tremendous working over time. I don't know how Kevin and the guys do it. Absolutely fabulous response. And at the level of the community, our district medical officers, our nurses, they have gone out of their way to make sure that we are in this position that we are in. Our contact tracing teams have done a wonderful job. You know, by and large, I can almost put my hand up and say that the response of our medical community in Grenada is up there with the best in the region. And that is why we are where we are today. And if we continue to do the things that we are advised to do, if we stop spreading the rumors <laughs> that we will be in a good position, if we observe our social distancing, that we will be in an, a better position in the next few weeks' time. So I want to commend our staff. I want to give them you know, all the kudos that they deserve and to ask them to continue to serve our nation as the patriots that they have been. Dr. Mitchell, I have a question. Read the preparedness of Karaku, the hospital there, in the event that there is a COVID-19 case uh, identified on that sister island. This question came up before. Our medical team in Karaku and P.T. Martinique uh, knows what to do. As you would realize, when a patient is diagnosed with COVID-19, that patient don't fall down, as we saw in that video um, a few weeks ago, um, that sort of like went viral. Someone, when we, were, when we started to spray the area, um, someone fell, and uh, the, the video was saying that, um, that, hey, look, COVID is in Grenada, someone fell. Um, it doesn't happen like that. As you can see with the persons who we have, uh, we have diagnosed here, the persons are, 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 are basically sick with flu-like symptoms and so forth. And as such, uh, the protocol is that that person is managed. And if, unfortunately, that person needs further attention or hospitalization, then that person will be transferred to Grenada. Um, if anyone who needs the type of support that you would get in a hospital, as we call assisted ventilation, the mechanism has been put in place to transfer that person from Karaku or P.T. Martinique to Grenada. Uh, the kind of expertise that you would need on the island is just not available there, and that is a fact. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, members of the media, I know you have several remaining questions, but we've been at this for now um, an hour and 30 minutes, and we recognize that some stations do have to go to their newscast. With the questions that you uh, still have remaining, please continue to send them in, and uh, myself and GIS will continue working and providing uh, the answers to those questions via interviews that we will conduct over the next uh, few days or so. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so very much. I would like to invite you to make some uh, closing comments. Maybe we can start with you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Ms. Robertson. I just want to take the opportunity to thank the general public for their continued cooperation and support, and particularly to recognize the effort and the growing trend 
that we are doing in maintaining physical distances. And from what I've seen today, certainly the growing practice of us using our mask in public space. This is a very difficult task for all of us. And I just want to appeal for tolerance, patience, and understanding in these trying times as we work together to, through this very difficult situation to find ourselves in a better place. And before I conclude, I, I, it will be remiss if I do not say my a special thanks to the members of the RGPF for their continued commitment and dedication to duty in this very, very trying time, not regarding the circumstances and not regarding the fact that we are actually in a fight against an invisible enemy. I want to encourage you, colleague officers, to remain focused and to remain committed to the cause and continue to serve our nation with distinction and professionalism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Dr. Mitchell? I will be very short. I just want to reiterate our um, appreciation for um, the persons that have been on the front line, all our health care professionals at all level. I also want to say thank you to all members of the public who have come forward in one way or the other uh, to the cause, those who have supported us, those who have said to us, shut down the country, guys. Um, this is the best thing to do. Um, we, 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 we appreciate your support. And I also appreciate those who have actually criticized what we have done and come forward with suggestions. It makes us a better people. It makes the response better. It tells us that you care about Grenada. So all in all, um, I want to just like thank everybody for their continued support, and I want to give the assurance that the COVID committee would work night and day to ensure that Grenada and Grenadians remain safe. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mitchell. And now to the other Dr. Mitchell for the final word this evening. Yes, um, let me just, um, in closing, reinforce the comments of um, Dr. George Mitchell and, of course, Commissioner Martin. Uh, on the compliments given to the health workers, the frontline persons and the police officers, and all the persons, uh, ordinary citizens who are coming forward and providing help to the elderly out there. I think um, we want to commend you to the religious community. Um, I also want to, to hold my hand out to, to them. Um, for their continued support and also providing leadership to their community at this particular time and guiding them to be safe. I, I do want to, to add my comment in that particular area. But I also want to commend my cabinet colleagues for, for their continued um, support and hard work and putting themselves on the front line, really, with their, with their different constituents we had a cabinet, virtual cabinet meeting today online, and um, it was as effective as being there together. So we are doing what we are advising others to do as much as possible. And I, I just want to compliment all of the people of our country who are sticking to what we believe is necessary to be done. I just want to add a word of caution. As I attempt to drive around sometimes, to look and see what's happening. I see some of our elderly citizens sometime unwittingly and knowingly walking around or sitting uh, around. And I think it's the responsibility of all of us, if we see it in our community, to advise them that that should not happen because they are the most vulnerable persons in the community um, that we have to be looking at. And I also have to one others, um, the country as a whole. Brothers and sisters, remember, the health of your health is the most, one of the most important thing. Um, I do not, I do not ease up on my daily exercise. I think this is a absolutely crucial. I think we, while tendency is because a lot of us don't, don't usually find ourselves in our homes for this lengthy time, and we might tend to, this, it is said when you're home a lot, you tend to pass by the refrigerator a lot. 
we have to ban the refrigerator to some extent because that would encourage us to be obese. And that is a factor that would aid the virus if something happens to any one of us. So I'm giving a doctor's advice. I'm not a doctor. I'm actually sitting there to me. But I think it's important, very important, and um, to, to, uh, to, to ask all of us to do so. But I take off my prime minister hat and I put on the hat of the parliamentary representative for Northwest St. George's. And, and to say it, it feels for me for the people of Northwest St. George's, particularly so at this time, because they're dealing with three major issues at one time. The millennia problem with the road has been has affected business and, and, and the social and economic life of the people of Northwest St. George's in a very serious way. And immediately afterwards, we're dealing with COVID-19. And even before that, perseverance dump and the smoke and inhalation, inhalation with the people there. We don't know the impact of this on the health of the people in the community. Uh, I went up there last week, and um, I certainly felt real sorry for the community. Having to sleep in that condition there, it's, it's, it's testing, and it's worrying to me as the parliamentary representative. And I, I, I of course, be speaking to the, to the um, ministry, the Solid Waste Division, to do what they can. But uh, as, as you realize, given COVID-19, that is the emphasis right now. And it is certainly affecting whatever initiative can be taken. So I, I just want to call on my friends there, my brothers and sisters, throughout the length and breadth of Northwest St. George's. To, um, to understand that I, 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 I feel your pain at this particular time. On a final note, you know, I, I, with all the problems happening, sometimes you have to have a sense of humor in, in all that is taking place. If you don't have humor, you can, you can, we all can go crazy in this time. And a lot of people send me a lot of fun jokes to cheer me up in this time. I, I want to send them um, to... Out, to, to to say to them, I deeply appreciate. I have some really he hectic laugh sometimes, which relaxes me. In fact, one, one, the last one I received was, um, and two persons sent me. It's strange enough, they know that I like cr cricket a lot, so they sent me uh, um, the the last one of the innings of Brian Lara in in Barbados in in the 80s when they beat England, and they say, Prime Minister, I know you love to 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 watch this, and almost 20 minutes of this. And Brian R. saying that this was his, the best cricket innings he has ever played in Bar that Barbados innings. Not, the, not the, the world record, that in Barbados. So I just want to thank every single body in the country and to thank all who are working together. Let's, let's, let's stay together. Let's build back together. Let us beat this thing together. And I'm pretty sure we will win. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, and to the other members of the panel, Acting Commissioner of Police, Edwin Martin, and our COVID coordinator, COVID-19 coordinator here in Grenada, Dr. George Mitchell. I am Press Secretary Philomena Robertson. We are so appreciative that you've stayed with us for this extended press briefing. Some key takeaways for you. The 24-hour curfew continues until 7 a.m. on April 20th. The next shopping day will be on Saturday, and that's because based on the scientific and medical modeling, the next couple of days will be a critical period. So we really need persons to stay indoors and comply with the regulations. Grenadians all, let us continue to be safe. Let us follow the advice of the experts. Stay positive. Think positive. We will get through this together. We are a resilient people, a resilient nation. I'm Philomena Robertson. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Bitch.